class is now in session. I am Professor Hockey, and today we'll be discussing a very early look at what the Sharks' defensive pairings could look like heading into the 24-25 season. Now, it is quite clear that there won't be nearly as much competition for a spot on the back end for San Jose compared to in the forward lines, where there's like 10 or 11 different players vying for just four spots in the Sharks' forward group, in the Sharks' bottom six, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be some interesting decision points to be made for Ryan Worsofsky. The Sharks do still have more than six players who are capable of playing defense at the NHL level, or at the very least, will be given time to play defense at the NHL level for the San Jose Sharks, and so there will likely be some rotations and some controversial choices made anyhow. And we start off with the Sharks' top pairing of Ferraro and Emerson. I want to start talking a bit about Mario Ferraro, where at, during the early parts of his career, yeah, he was eased into a role playing in that third pairing, but he quickly worked his way up to the top pairing with Brent Burns, where he has remained pretty much since then. And even if those in those early years he was playing with Burns and playing with Eric Carlson, those were the two players who would steal the headlines and make the offensive plays. For many, many years now, he has been a top pairing guy for the Sharks defensively in those really, really tough situations. And statistically, that hasn't really backed up that type of usage. Ferraro statistically hasn't really been all that impressive, and on an actual good team would probably be more so served for like a fourth defensive position. And yet, because the Sharks have lacked any better options for that particular role, Ferraro has been thrust and has been forced into playing that spot. For this upcoming season, however, there will hopefully be a bit of a relief in pressure on Ferraro's back. As the Sharks, their one change that they've made to the back end is acquiring Jake Wallman from the Detroit Red Wings. Now, Wallman isn't some sort of defensive stalwart who will clearly take every possible role from Mario Ferraro and be the Sharks' number one defensive guy by far, but he will allow Ferraro to slide from a number one slot into a more of a 1A, 1B situation because Wallman in Detroit was used in a very similar situation as what Ferraro did. I'll talk about that a bit later, but for now, what I'm trying to make the point of is that Ferraro will likely see a bit of a reduction in terms of ice time, which might normally be viewed as a, a bad thing, but in this case will probably end up being a good thing because it should coincide with a rise in level of play as he's going to be tasked with such a lower amount of tough, tough situations. Last year, it felt as though nine times out of ten, as long as Ferraro wasn't on the ice for the previous shift, he would be tossed over the boards to take a tough defensive zone faceoff. Now, that could get dropped to seven times out of ten, six times of ten, six times out of ten, because Wallman is going to be, a, hopefully, a very viable option for Rosowski to go for as well. So while I do have Ferraro on the top pairing currently, strictly because of the fact that Rosowski, who's been with the San Jose Sharks this past couple of years, is going to be more familiar with him, him, it is certainly possible that Wallman could end up taking such a spot and Ferraro will be more of a top four defenseman compared to his previous roles as the clear number one cut guy for San Jose. As a defensive partner this season, I have him with Ty Emerson. Emerson is a very interesting player, played his rookie year with the San Jose Sharks this past season, but only played about 30 games. This isn't because he was frequently benched and healthy scratch, but instead because he was injured for a good chunk of the year. When he was actually healthy, he was one of the Sharks' better defensemen and found some really good chemistry when playing specifically with Mario Ferraro. On top of that, Emerson fills a very important need for the San Jose Sharks as a right-handed defenseman, something that they lack in their system currently and so it shouldn't be all that difficult for Emerson to earn a consistent spot in the lineup for the San Jose Sharks next season whether or not he manages to maintain a top pairing spot that's a different question but should he find himself in the Sharks top six probably more often than not uh Emerson, interestingly enough, wasn't actually under contract until a few days ago. He had elected to file for arbitration. I don't really know what leg he would have been able to stand on to actually negotiate much of a different contract than when he ended up getting. Perhaps it was just a move to try and force the hand of Mike Greer, but it ends up being a $950,000 contract for just one year because both Greer and Emerson don't really want to commit to any more than that. From Emerson's perspective, he knows he played quite well this past season, but he also knows that he's not really good Good enough because of the short sample size to actually get a long-term contract with some real NHL dollars behind that. 
So he wants to sort of have this prove it season for himself. And on the other side of things, Mike Greer doesn't want to give him an extended year contract because the Sharks in the past, maybe not under Greer, but still have been burned with defensemen who have come in like really, really good in their first year, first couple of years, but then have gotten some significant injuries that have held them back for pretty much the rest of their career. It happened with Nikolai Knizhov, who the Sharks recently, a few weeks ago, terminated the contract of. It also happened with Redim Shemek. So who's to say a similar situation can't happen with Emerson? So both sides of this situation, the shark side and the player side, both sort of keeping it very conservative. And so this is going to be a very important prove it year for Emerson to see what he can really do in terms of future with this organization. And he should really be given every opportunity to prove himself. As we move on to the second pairing, this is where I have Jake Wallman, the newest addition to the San Jose Sharks, and I actually have him playing on his offside. Like I said, the Sharks have a lack of right-handed defensemen in their system, so one of their lefties has to play the offside, and because I don't really want Thrun doing that situation, want to keep him as comfortable as possible considering he's still a developing prospect, I have Wallman doing it here. It technically could be Ferraro. Like I said, it really depends who ends up getting that time with Emerson on the top pairing. But currently, I have Wallman here. He was acquired from the Detroit Red Wings in one of the weirdest trades that we have seen in the NHL in a very long time. Not only do the Sharks manage to get Wallman for free, but they actually get paid a second round pick for him to come to San Jose. And it's not as though Wallman is some terrible player on a horrible contract. In fact, he was on the the Detroit Red Wings top pairing this past season with their number one defenseman, Moritz Sider. Now, technically, his defensive statistics weren't necessarily that impressive, but it's because he was faced in similar situations as Mario Ferraro. In fact, Wallman faced some of the toughest competition this past season on the back end. Two years ago, though, Wallman actually did put up some really strong numbers in Detroit. So hope for the Sharks, they're hoping that he can get back to that level. And like I already said, defensively, he's going to relieve a lot of the pressure from Mario Ferraro. But on top of that, from an offensive perspective, he's also a bit of a puck mover, not anything super impressive. His point totals don't necessarily jump off the page, just 21 points last season, though 12 goals Uh, 12 of those were goals for himself, but he does have some innate puck moving capabilities, certainly better than anybody else, at least currently that the Sharks have on the roster, at least expected wise. And so that will allow him to probably end up getting some top power play minutes with San Jose. And the Sharks power play was improving as the year had gone on. And with next year, the additions of players like Tyler Toffoli, Macklin Celebrini, and Will Smith, Jake Wallman playing that top power play unit could see a considerable rise in terms of points totals we shall see if his puck moving capabilities will actually be able to hold up or if it will end up like a Kalen Addison situation but hopefully he will be a positive impact to the Sharks top four when it comes to Henry Thrun, I have him as the defensive partner of Jake Wallman to hopefully give him a bit of stability because Thrun was one of the more inconsistent players that the San Jose Sharks had this past season. Usually when it comes to these young guys, you are expecting a certain level of inconsistency, but Thrun turned that up to 11. One game, he would be fantastic, elite, top pairing capable. Then the following game, he would be absolutely horrible, not even looking like an NHL player with like 10 different giveaways in his own zone. And it was just fluctuating between those two different levels good, bad, terrible, good, bad, great, terrible, bad, over and over and over again. And his defensive partner, Jan Ruda, certainly didn't help in that particular position because he himself was also extremely inconsistent. So Thrun coming in now to a sophomore season, a year under his belt, I am hopeful that he'll be able to be much less of a wild card and more of a stable top four defenseman for the San Jose Sharks. But realistically, I can't actually say if that's going to be a thing for sure. He should have a top six spot more or less locked down just because he is is a part of the future for the San Jose Sharks, but we shall indeed see what ends up happening with him. It is the third defensive pairing for the San Jose Sharks that really carries the most intrigue, as this is where we will likely see more of the substitutions occurring. Currently, I have as their bottom pairing Shakir Mukamadoulin and Matt Benning. Benning seems to be a defenseman who has been somewhat forgotten by a lot of Sharks fans because he missed the majority of this past season due to a huge injury that kept him out of the lineup for so, so long. But I don't believe I've missed any big news. I do expect Matt Benning will be healthy for training camp and going into this next season. And he, like Emerson, fills a very important need for the San Jose Sharks as a right-handed defenseman. And a couple of years back in his first season with San Jose, he was actually one of the Sharks' better defensemen. So as long as he proves himself still capable of playing at an NHL speed, 
because of his right-handed positioning, he likely will end up earning a spot in the lineup. And I think he could actually be a pretty good influence on his defensive partner in this situation, Shakir Mukhamadoulin. A lot of the same arguments that I used when discussing Bordalo and Gushin in my forward line video still apply to Mukama Doolin here. He played a full season with the Barracuda this past year. He was quite good there. He even got three season or three games in the NHL this past season where he was solid enough, at least just from a defensive standpoint, that David Quinn felt comfortable with giving him over 21 minutes of ice time averaged out through those three games. So it seems as though he is ready to take that next step in his career and get some time at the NHL. NHL level. And unlike on the forward slot, there isn't necessarily that much competition and that many players who you are specifically having brought in to take that slot. So realistically, this should be a much easier choice for Ryan Worsofsky to get Mukamadul in some of that ice time and for allowing him to prove if he is capable of playing at the NHL level. And like I said, going with someone like Matt Benning, who's one of the more experienced defensemen that the Sharks actually have on the roster, should hopefully do him some good. And so I think while this top six is not not super impressive. It's still likely one of the worst top sixes in the NHL currently going into next season. It should see some notable improvement with the addition of Wallman. And if Thrun and Mukamadulin take some decent steps forward in their development as well, including Emerson on top of that, it might not be all that terrible and certainly better than last year's awful, awful group. When it comes to the guys on the outside looking in, the top one is of course Jan Ruda. He should be the clear-cut number seven defenseman for the San Jose Sharks. He was expected when acquired to bring a certain level of stability to the lineup as an experienced guy with Stanley Cup Finals uh, uh, experience with the Tampa Bay Lightning. But honestly, his game was kind of immature, kind of up and down, inconsistent this past season. If you had removed the name on the back of his jersey, I didn't would not have really pointed to him as a Stanley Cup winning defenseman because it just didn't really feel as though his game was all that there. And considering the fact that he is a lefty, so he doesn't really have that same level of priority for the San Jose Sharks, and I would much rather see someone like Mukhamadoulin in the lineup, I personally have Jan Ruda as that seventh defenseman. It's certainly possible, of course, that War- Warsawski will feel differently than me and that Mukhamadoulin will unfortunately end up riding the bench kind of like the situation with Thomas Bordelow on the forward side of things but I think that Mukhamadoulin should be serving the Sharks better. Ruta technically is someone who is slightly more comfortable with playing the right side, so maybe that could be a factor. On top of that, Ruta on the final year of his contract, maybe the Sharks want to give him more time in the NHL to prove himself capable so that they can move him a bit easier at the deadline and get like a fourth round pick. But outside of those types of notions, it feels as though he should be the perfect number seven defenseman for the San Jose Sharks instead of in case of an injury or in case of someone faltering a bit. When it comes to the eighth defenseman here, we have Mark Edward Vlasic, and I want to use this opportunity to touch on an interview that Vlasic gave a couple of weeks ago that I read. Now, Vlasic has always been a very interesting interview. Most NHL players will keep things extremely safe when talking to the media with classic canned cliches and lines. Oh, we got to stay out of the box. We got to stick to our game. We got to get pucks deep, things of that nature. Mark Edward Vlasic has always been the type of player to speak his mind, and speak his mind he did in this particular interview. A couple of points that I want to touch on, the first of which is him saying that he didn't request a trade heading into this season because he enjoyed the direction that the Sharks were taking with the team, with the additions of Toffoli, Wenberg, as well as the couple of young players that they brought in as well, which is a notion that I found extremely hilarious because of the fact that even if Vlasic had requested a trade, and he went to Mike Greer and requested a trade every single single day for the next 365 days, by this time next year, he would still be a San Jose Shark. Not because Mike Greer really wants to keep him on the team, but Mike Greer is pretty much forced to do so because Vlasic's contract is one of, if not the worst one, in the entire league. Even if the Sharks could retain 50% of that contract, which they cannot do, even Vlasic at $3.5 million would be a tough sell for any team. So for the notion that, oh, well, I didn't request a trade because uh, I like the direction of the team, it didn't matter if he did or if he didn't, he was going to remain with the San Jose Sharks anyway. On top of that, I remember mentioning when David Quinn was fired, and it was a few days after the Sharks player exit interviews, that it is very possible that a few of the players were disappointed with David Quinn. Well, Vlasic made it quite clear that he was one of those guys, even though Quinn actually still played him more games than he probably should have gotten over 50 games this past season, he was upset 
that with the amount of healthy scratches he actually ended up getting. It's actually one of the things that I actually somewhat agreed with with David Quinn when it came to his lineup management management with those healthy scratches when it came to Mark Edward Vlasic. And so going into next season, Vlasic will likely still try to be petitioning to try and get some spots in the lineup. And hopefully Warsawski can hold strong because I would personally believe that in a perfect world, outside of some crazy injuries to the lineup, that Vlasic will not get any games in the NHL. In a more slightly realistic but still optimistic world, maybe a couple of these players falter, maybe a couple of things actually happen and Vlasic gets something like 15 or 20 games. Hopefully, though, the Sharks can avoid once again giving him a bunch of games because it is quite clear that we have learned over the last five years, not just one single blip, but five years, that Vlasic is not capable of actually playing at a good NHL level. The usual faults in his game, like the lack of hitting and lack of engagement, were made up with the fact that he was so smart and thought the game so well back in his prime seasons. That has disappeared, so now he's just a completely disengaged defenseman in his own zone who is clearly not deserving of a lineup spot. And then the final defenseman to technically consider would be Jack Thompson. He's more of a ninth defenseman guy who would realistically only be a factor if there are tons of injuries or post-trade deadline if the Sharks actually get rid of a couple of players. That would have to be like Ruda and Ferraro and Wallman or things of that nature. Then maybe we'll see Thompson get a couple of games, but realistically, he probably won't factor in much. And he'll probably have to tough it out with the Barracuda once again. But that will do it for this lineup preview. Like I said, there aren't as many decisions to be made here on the back end for the San Jose Sharks, though you never know what Mike Greer still might try to do over these coming months. There is still time. There are still defensemen available. And if the Sharks want a more proven puck mover like a Tyson Barry, they could still go out and sign a player like that. But currently, the Sharks defensive group is an improvement over last year, not necessarily by a huge margin, but at the very least should be slightly more interesting to watch with hopefully young players like Emerson, Mukamadulin, and Tron filling it out. Class dismissed.